Hello and welcome to the BUSS2 live revision session where we're going to look at the second half which goes with our first YouTube video I've made. We're going to cover the marketing and HR aspects of the AQA exam paper. Those of you that have joined me before will know that I had a few technical problems today with the computer system so as a result this should have gone live but it's not going live. We're now back online and all being sorted so I'm going to treat this as a live session. You can treat me at any point so remember at B Business B. And I'll answer the questions, or if you post the comments below, we'll sort those questions out, no problems. Uh, I'm just going to take a look at what we're going to cover in this session. So we're going to look at first what the BUSS2 exam actually requires of you. We're going to look at organisational structures. Then we're going to look at the effectiveness of the workforce. Recruitment selection and training. Motivation. Effective marketing. The marketing mix. Marketing and competitiveness. And then we're going to take a look at any questions that you may have. But clearly, with this being recorded, there won't be any questions. I didn't really think about that one, did I? Okay, let's take a look at BUSS2 exam. It's actually called Managing a Business. It's worth 60% of your AS and 30% of your A-level. It's a one-hour, 30-minute examination, which is 80 marks and comprised of two case studies, which are multi-part response questions. So it's going to be a little bit more demanding than the BUSS1 exam. However, it's something you can easily achieve. Okay then, so let's take a look at what an organisational structure actually is. An organisational structure is the way jobs and responsibilities and power are organised within a business. Now, a typical organisational structure may look like the one I'm showing you here. Now, within this structure, you've got layers of hierarchy, which shows you levels of management. You've got the chain of command, which shows you the lines of authority in the organisation. And you've got the span of control, which shows a number of subordinates that people control in the business. So let's try and apply that same. So, the span of control is how many people does this person here control? So they control one, two, three, four, five, and six. So if we were to look at the director of marketing here, he controls directly one and two. So you can see the span of control, the number of people they control. So it depends on how many people they actually control. The chain of command is obviously the instruction of how far it goes down the line. So the lines of authority. So the chain of command down to there and then down to there, and then down to there. The layers of hierarchy are how many levels of management. So in this organization, we've got one level, we've got two levels, and we've got three levels of management in this structure here. Because remember, it's only the levels of management. We don't include our lower level workers who aren't management. So it's only our managers we're including. So three levels of management in that business organization there. I hope that makes some sense to you. Have a look at how we take this further. So within the structures you've got, you're meant to know about hierarchical structures. Now they're the tall and flat structures. So typically they look like either a pyramid like that, so a tall structure, a nice tall traditional structure. We may have a flatter pyramid, one that looks just like that, so it's a lot flatter than a little pyramid. Now these are more traditional. Typically these are the ones where you get lots of promotional opportunities and people can see where they can aspire to climb the ladder. So you find these in more traditional organisations. You may have a matrix structure, and these are more based around projects. So people from each functional area come together to work as a team, and they're assigned a little role within that team, and they focus on their marketing or their HR or their finance or their operations. They work together. It's more of a grid, a matrix together. Some organizations, you'll get an entrepreneurial culture. This is more centralized control from the owner. The owner comes up with the ideas and drives the business forward. Typically, in an entrepreneurial culture, you get quick decisions. You have a very small team around you, but you're based around the vision of the owner. That's how it typically works. Okay, let's look at some of the different workforce roles that exist. So, within the workforce, you've got supervisors. Now, these are directly in charge of one or more subordinates. Typically, they tend to manage the people towards the bottom of your hierarchical structure. Then you may have team leaders. Now, these are responsible for managing and leading a whole team and driving a team forward to success. So these tend to work in organizations where each team is assigned smaller, shorter roles to do. You've got managers. These are employees who are responsible for the operation of a business and a specific area of the business. So again, these are now getting higher up the hierarchical structure. And then you've got directors, and these are the people appointed by the shareholders who are there to run your business organization. Now, within your organization, you probably want to measure the effectiveness of your work. Okay, this brings about two formulas you have to know. The first one we've got to know is what's called labor turnover. This is the number of employees who are leaving your business each year. So this is measured as a percentage, how many people leave your business. Now, if you've got a high labor turnover, this is bad for your organization. It shows that something's wrong with the motivation in the workforce, and it's all not good. 
Now you've got the number of leavers per year divided by the average number of employees per year times 100. And this will give you a percentage. A high percentage suggests you've got lots of people leaving the business. A low percentage means you've got not many. Remember, a higher percentage of labor turnover means you're recruiting more staff. So that's more cost straight away. More training to so the staff that keep coming in. And it probably indicates they're not motivated. Now, that's one of the things you've got to consider. So normally, a low labor turnover is good for an organization. You've also got labor productivity, which you're meant to be able to calculate. And that is a total value of output divided by the number of employees. And you're trying to work out how many units each employee actually produces. Obviously, the higher the units, the better the business is performing because they're more efficient and more productive. And that leads us nicely on to looking for the best people in your business. Of course, it's recruitment, training, and selection. So what is the recruitment process? Because this is something we always talk about, but what actually is it? Well, the recruitment process tends to start with the old idea of you've got to identify the vacancy. You need to know what job is available. Once you find out what job is available, you need to write a job description and a personal specification. So you're actually listing what are the requirements of the job first and what's that person got to do and what would the ideal person for the job look like. So not look as in physically look like, more like in what criteria, what qualities they bring to the organisation. And then, of course, you're going to advertise the position. You made it out in a local newspaper. You made it internally or externally. You've got to depend on your position. We'll have a look at that later. And then hopefully you'll receive and process your applications. And the advertising bit brings about that part there. You may do what's called internal recruitment, where you do a notice board or a promotion to internally promote people in your business. Or you may do it externally, so you do it by job adverts, agencies, on the internet. Now, if you do it internally, you tend to make your staff feel motivated because they see they've got a chance to progress. Remember Maslow's theory of self-actualization, progressing to the workplace. So it's a great motivational tool. However, it can limit the skills available in the workplace because you're always recruiting people who've been in that same workplace, those same skills, they bring nothing new to the business. Maybe you need somebody externally who can drive your business forward. Externally, you tend to find you've got new ideas, new innovation coming in. You can actually tap into these ideas and drive your business forward. You get a better pool of candidates sometimes. However, you also to consider the fact that you don't really know who these people are. You don't know why they're leaving their other jobs. You don't know really how skilled they are. So you are taking a risk at that point. And again, what impact does that have on your existing workforce? Does it demotivate them because they think you're going to always recruit somebody from outside of the business? So let's say you want to recruit. You've done all your advertising. How does a selection process work? Well, typically the selection process works like that. You have an interview. And then you may ask them to do a presentation. So you might get them to talk about the topic or theme when they come to visit you. Uh, they may even send you on an assessment centre where they go and watch you and observe you complete tasks. And then they'll try and see if you're a team player. Of course, the problem with that is it's really, really expensive and it's not cheap. And you're starting to bring in more and more cost to the process. Or you could do psychometric tests. Again, something which a lot of companies are looking to do these days. However, again, it's expensive. So typically, you find most companies just use the, the option of an interview, which is, okay, it's short-term, it's time-consuming, but uh, however, it's probably the cheapest option co when combined and considered with assessment centers and psychometric tests. Then, of course, once you've rec recruited somebody, you've got to think about your training. Do you do what's on the job training? So do you train the people actually in your workplace, doing the job that they will be doing every single day? If you do this, then it's, they get to see the job they're going to do, they get more of a feel for the job. However, they're probably going to slow down the production line and have an impact on productivity of everybody else. It may lower your capacity utilization in the short term. Off the job training, well, actually, send them off to a training center or somewhere to train. That could be really, really expensive. So, the problem with that can be is in the short term, it's more expensive, but then maybe in the long term, they will come back to your business with better skills, new ideas that they can implement in the workplace. And then, of course, do you give them an induction? Do you make them feel part of a team? Is that something that's going to be one of the missing elements that's going to make a difference in your business? Some companies would argue an induction makes a difference. Others would argue it has no effect at all. And then, of course, that leads us lovely into motivation. Because if your workforce aren't motivated, they're more likely to leave. And remember, that's increasing your costs all the time. So, motivation. What do you think motivates employees in a workplace? I'm hoping you're thinking... Payment is one of the methods that motivates. Responsibility is one of the elements that motivates. Praise is certainly going to motivate them, making them feel like they're being rewarded for what they do. 
empowering them, giving them more responsibility in the workplace, and rewarding them. Um, you know, send them off on little trips or little competitions. That's a great way to motivate and really inspire your workers to feel like they're being motivated and respected in the workplace. Now, that brings us on to these theories you've got to learn. You've got to learn some theories of motivation. You need to know them, basically, more so. And the first one is this guy called Frederick Taylor. Now, Frederick Taylor's theory is dead easy. Tay and pay. Remember, tay, pay, tay, pay. Just get it in your head, you know. That's a dead easy way to think about it. Frederick Taylor's theory is all about payment. He said workers then try to go to work, but they only go to work really to earn money. And his theory is all based about earning money. He believed that money motivated, quite simply. And if you wanted to make workers work harder, you put them on piecework. So the more items they make, the more they earn. And of course, he said it's a really effective method. Of course, the problem with that is quality suffers because they work quicker, they work harder and faster, but actually they get paid by how many they make and not how good a quality the items they make are. And he said that workers should be trained to do one job well. So again, he thought that you had to be specialised in one job and not any other job, which of course can lead to issues of getting bored doing the same job. Imagine being told your job is to put the wheel on a car every single day. So of course, some people didn't agree with this idea, and along came a chap called Elton Mayo. Now Elton Mayo had a totally different view to Taylor. He said that workers are motivated by having a social needs met. Now, he did a survey called the, uh, the Hawthorne Effect, and basically what he came up with is this. He said that managers and employees communicate with each other actually motivates. And so employees love it when managers talk to them and make them feel like part of a team. He also said that employees like managers showing an interest in them. So showing an interest motivates, and he said working in teams motivates. Now, as you can imagine, Taylor is not a fan of this idea because Taylor, of course, said about piecework. They go to work for money, not for team working. But, of course, I like another theory. And this theory actually thought about what was said before. So he thought about Taylor's theory, he thought about Mayo's theory. And he thought, well, hang on, they've both got elements that are going to probably make some sense. And this chap was called Abraham Maslow. And he devised what's called a hierarchy of needs. And what he said was that each level has to be fulfilled before the next one actually motivates. So in Maslow's theory, we start off, we all have physiological needs. We all need food, water, shelter, heating in our workplace. And we all get motivated by that. Once we've got that... Then we start thinking about we want some security, some job security. We want to feel safe in our job. We want some protection. So we want to know that our job is there next week or the week after or the week after. Then he said that we start worrying about social needs then. So we want to feel like part of a team. We want to feel like part of the organisation. And then once they've been satisfied, then we want some self-esteem. We want some praise. We want some recognition. We want to be rewarded for what we do. And then last but not least, which is quite controversial, he said then we want to self-actualise. We want to achieve our dreams within the organisation. And that was Maslow's belief. Now, there was a problem with this, that another chap came along called Frederick Hertzberg, and his belief was that Maslow's theory was outdated. He quite simply said that some factors motivate, some factors demotivate. You have motivators and demotivators. And he said that Maslow's theory, basically, the only things that motivate are job enlargement, so making somebody's job bigger, making somebody's job more exciting, so giving them more responsibility, or giving them more control. And he said that empowerment, so making decisions, motivated. So he liked these elements here about more control, more decision making. They were the things that he liked. He said that everything else demotivates, quite simply. You do not get excited about being able to go to the toilet. You do not get excited about the fact that you've got a job. Now, of course, this is probably because the time has kept moving on and we start to expect more and more. So what I've done here is I've put them into a nice, simple diagram that I've created. So as you see, Frederick Taylor's theory of pay is a physiological need. Mayo's theory of social factors tends to fit here. So there's his little factors fit in there. Now, Hertzberg's factors tend to fit lovely with Maslow there. Maslow's physiological and safety needs are what Hertzberg would say, expectations. We no longer get excited about them. You no longer get excited about the fact that you feel safe at work. You no longer get excited about the fact that you can go to the toilet at work. However, you may be motivated by the fact that you feel part of a team. You may be motivated by the fact that you are being rewarded in the organisation and being respected and given more decision making. You may be, feel motivated because you're allowed to self-actualise and achieve your goals and your aims. And that's how the theories all link together. Hopefully that makes some sense. And that concludes the elements of human resources that you need to know for your BUSS2 exam. Now we're going to move on to look at some of the marketing theories. 
Effective marketing. The purpose of marketing is to meet the customer's needs and wants. Now, within marketing, we've got two markets. We've got a niche market, which is a small, specialised market like Bentley Motorcar, who aim their products at a very small niche. And we've also got a mass market, which aim at a more larger general market, like Coca-Cola or Tesco would be aimed in a mass market. Now, how we appeal to our market and our chosen target audience depends on their needs and wants. And this comes down to called the marketing mix. Now, the marketing mix is a tool that is used in marketing to best ensure successful marketing of a product or service. And what the marketing mix comprises of is that there. Price, place, product and promotion. Or what you will have heard called the four P's. Now, all elements of the marketing mix have to work together. Now, you may have been taught them separately, but we're going to look at them in tandem together. Because you have to get these working together to make it successful. So, for example, you've got to consider how much money you've got available to make these work properly. What's your technological skills and resources you've got available to make them work properly? What's your market research telling you that enables you to make these work properly? Now, one of the obvious things you've got to consider is price. So, let's look at P. So, we've got some pricing strategies. Now, strategies tend to be the long-term plans that you've got for your pricing. So, for example, you've got price skimming. So, this is where you charge a high price to try and attract a high socioeconomic group. So, this is your A, B's, and perhaps your C1s you're looking for. You're going for your high socioeconomic groups. Apple is a good example of this. They charge a high price, and they only want to attract customers who are going to afford it. It's all about protecting your brand image, and it enables you to make a large profit. You've got price taking, where you just look at the, your price, price of your rivals, and you just use it. Typically, you've got to be careful with this, that you're not going to fall foul of competition and doing price fixing. So you don't want to talk to them. But price taking, you can look at their price and you basically use the same price. You tend to find Coca-Cola and Pepsi do this quite a lot. They will use the price and let the brand, the power of the brand, actually sell the product. You've got penetration pricing. Now, when you penetrate something, you think about it, you hit the market hard. You're trying to burst in there. You're penetrating. You're getting in there. This typically is on a new product. You charge a low price with the aim of gaining market share. You're normally typically a new product in the market here and you're trying to develop yourself. Or you might become a price leader. And this is where you can dominate the market. So because of that, you set the price you want to charge. So anybody who's in charge of the market, so let's take, for example, BT. BT can charge whatever price they want, and the others will tend to follow them because BT is the price leader in the market. Now, underneath pricing strategies, you tend to have these, if they are the long-term aims, then we've got some objectives to be met. And the objectives tend to be called tactics. So these are tactics. These are short-term options we use. And we have these things called a loss leader. Now, believe it or not, some companies sell their products at a loss. They will sell one item or two items. Now, the aim here is to get people to come to your business. It's a great marketing tool. A lot of supermarkets sell their petrol at a loss. Or Tesco at the moment is selling milk at a loss. And the aim is that when you sell one item at a loss, so let's say you're losing 10p on every bottle of milk if you're selling, because you think that when people go to your shop, they're not going to just buy milk. They're probably going to buy bread and they might buy eggs and they might go and buy a drink and they might buy a sandwich because it's lunchtime. And as soon as you start adding on the profit they make on all these items, you might actually be making 70 or 80p out of that customer. And that customer typically never went to your business beforehand. So you all of a sudden, yes, you're selling one item at a loss, but you're attracting more revenue from those other sales, which is a fantastic strategy. A lot of you, you find a strategy being used a lot by Little and Aldi with their special offers. A lot of those are sold to what they call loss leading strategies. And you also have psychological pricing. And this is where you use a number that makes the product appear cheaper than what it actually is. So you have like 99p or £1.47. So you might even have £1.50 like Mark Spencer's used, but it makes a product appear cheaper than what it actually is. And this can fool some customers into parting with their money. We also have to consider the other part of placement. Now, this is where the product is actually sold or distributed. Now, placement, you've got different things you've got to think about. You've got two different channels. You've got business to business and business to consumer. It's not confusing. It may think it is, but it's not. When a business sells to another business, that is a channel which is adopted. It's called business to business. An example of this would be like when Heinz sells to Tesco. Heinz is a business and Tesco is a business. So, Heinz sells to Tesco. That's business to business. Business consumer would be more like when Tesco sells to me because I'm a consumer, Tesco's a business. So if you think about the, the buying a tin of baked beans, it goes to their own It goes Heinz business to Tesco business and then it goes in Tesco business to me, consumer, B2C. 
and that's what they would typically call direct method. A lot of companies who do B2B as a traditional method of selling are trying to get into direct selling through a website because that enables it to. So you must have bought lots of times you will have bought from a company who's a manufacturer via their website and they've moved from a traditional method to a direct method. The advantage of that being that you get more added value in the tertiary sector so the product makes more profit and of course the business makes more money overall so you can sell less units and make more money and they like more control over who they're selling it to they get to build a relationship with the end customer now within pricing so let's go places first so placement is important because if you sell products in the wrong place and you don't maximize your sales potential then you won't actually sell enough items so for example in my little example here if you you wouldn't sell computers in a leisure center because that'd be silly. Nobody would go there. Nobody knows where to actually look for your product. Okay, now within pricing, you've got something called price elasticity of demand. Now, price elasticity, I've got a video on this which you might want to check out yourself, but it's there already to look at. It's the responsiveness of a change in demand to a change in price. If it's more responsive, then it's elastic. If it's less responsive, it's inelastic. Now, what I mean by this is, if a price increases by 20% and demand falls by 30, that means it's more responsive. That's bad for business because there must be lots of substitute products. There's a lack of brand loyalty. People are shopping around. Typically, products which are we've got lots of lots of substitutes around are price elastic. So these are like things like your supermarkets. If a product is inelastic, it's less responsive. So, for example, the price increases by 10% demand will fall by 5%. These are typically good for business because it means there's few substitutes and you've got lots of brand loyalty. So if you put your price up, you're going to make more money, which is fantastic if you're a business. Okay, promotion is the element of marketing you see most of the time. You've got two methods. We've got a borderline promotion, and that's promotion which is evident to the whole of the market. You've got below the line promotion, which is promotion which is more controlled, more targeted. And then you need to choose the right promotional method which takes into consideration factors such as the cost of your marketing campaign, who your target audience is, your customer expectations, and the actions of your competitors. So what are your competitors actually going to do? Will they respond and how will they respond to your market overall? And they've got to, you've got to consider all those factors because they are critical to the overall success and the overall promotional campaign you choose. Now, examples of promotion include advertising methods now you need to know within advertising things like TV radio newspapers online branding so think about your big brands so like a cola or Nokia or EE merchandising now merchandising is one of these things like could we give away free pens or a free stress ball or like my B business B t-shirts or it could be giving you point of sanity or like a fridge for your supermarket with coca-cola splashed all over it or a Wolves freezer for your ice cream Sales promotions like offers or competitions or limited editions. So you've all seen them happen all the time. Direct marketing. So it could be when you, you enter a competition and you're given your text or your email because you sign up on a website and they then send you an email saying, come and buy our products, here's an offer, here's a discount. That's a method of promotion. Or PR, public relations, which is a great tool used by every company out there normally. It's too, you too use this normally. Positive stories it will feed, so if it gives money to charity or does something really well or innovative, it will send it out to the press and the newspaper should print a nice story about it. Or it may try and limit the damage on a negative story. So let's take the Coca-Cola example with Dasani bottled water. When that story broke about it being tap water, Coca-Cola's PR department went into overdrive. They tried to limit the damage that could do to their brand and ultimately they shut down the companies in the UK because it thought it could do any damage to the Coca-Cola brand. So they managed the brand image. Now you've got product, the last P. Now it's important that you have a good product. A good product has a USP. It makes something, your product stand out from the rivals. It looks completely different from your rivals. Typically, you're going to find that you establish a USP through style, through branding, through features. Now factors that are going to influence your decision and your development of new products is going to be things like technology, it's going to be the competitors, it's going to be the entrepreneurial skills of the managers and owners. You've got to consider all these factors when thinking about what do you do when developing your new product. Have you got the facilities? Because technology costs lots of money. So you're going to have to invest in capital intensive production. It's going to cost you loads and loads of money. Have you got that capital available? 
If you have got it available, then great, but then what the shareholders are going to think about using the money for that. If you haven't, are you going to borrow it, and then what's the knock-on effect to that? Competitors' actions, so what are your competition going to do? What's the knock-on effect to your competition? How are they going to be affected by decisions made? Will they respond by actually then making more products quicker? And then the entrepreneurial skills, have you got the skills, the leadership, and the vision to actually make it happen? Okay, let's look at the product. So the product, you typically can look at this thing called the Boston Matrix, a BSG. Now, this is where you put products into a portfolio. And you should be able to use the portfolio to make decisions. You don't need to actually memorize the portfolio outright because you've just got to make a decision on what products are there. Now, it measures market growth against market share. So market share there, market growth there. A product in a low growing market with a high market share is a cash cow because you're actually making lots of money out of it. You're making low, lots of money, but it's not growing really quickly. You're not making a massive amount of money. A product in a low growing market with low market share is a dog. And believe it or not, you just put a dog down. That's the idea. What, you've got to ask that question, do you want to get rid of it? Because obviously, it's, it's costing you money. It's in a low market share. It's got, so it's got a low market share, it's in a low growing market. It's pointless having it, really. The one that causes the problem is the one where you've got the right market. You're in a high growing market, but you've got a low market share. So potentially in the right market, but you're small. How do you grow your organization? What do you do to make it bigger? So the problem with that is you've got to spend lots and lots of money typically, and that's where the problem starts. The good products are the ones when you're a star. So in your portfolio, if you've got any stars, you're in the right market with a high market growth rate. And for years, Apple has been exactly there. It's been the star. The iPhone has been the star for Apple, making all the money. Whereas, for example, the iMac probably is somewhere down there at the moment. It's probably in a low grey market, and it's actually it's got a low market share. The ones that cause a problem are like the iPad, because the iPad was typically up there, and now it's probably there. So you're thinking about that now. It's, it's got a low market share of the tablet market, however, it's in a growing market. And you've got to think about where that effect's going to be there. And of course, that's a Boston Matrix for you. Also, on product, we have this thing called a product life cycle. Now, a product life cycle is a tool that you can use to measure where in the lifespan is a product. So it might be in a development stage. Now, down here, it costs you money. And then you introduce your product, and your sales start to increase. It grows steeply. Notice a steep growth stage here because you're selling more products. It starts to mature or saturate the market, so it starts to slow down. And then it enters decline and starts to die off. Neither of that, that's not most products. Most products you've got, well, that's what the lifespan will be. So you about an iPhone. An iPhone probably is up here somewhere. It's probably getting close to declining. Whereas products like Weetabix are quite amazing. Because you know about Weetabix? Weetabix has been up there, and it's avoided declining. And that's because they do what's called an extension strategy. And you should adopt this just before you get to decline. So it turns like that. It keeps growing up like that. And then when you start to curve off again, you get another extension strategy. And another one. Now, you're meant to know what these extension strategies are. And this is where it links in with the promotion element. It can be things like competitions. Or it can be the packaging. Or it can even be the pricing methods you use. So linking the market together means that all of a sudden you start to develop a lifespan for your product and you keep increasing the number of sales. And that develops sales, that develops brand loyalty, and that develops customer awareness, and that keeps the sales going. And in an ideal product portfolio, you've got products all over there, apart from in decline. Because typically you want to keep extending the life of those products because you're selling more products, growing your brand. And that's where the extension strategy comes in. Now last but not least, you're meant to know about marketing and competitiveness. Now, in a market, you tend to have different conditions. Some markets, you've got few large businesses dominate the market, so like supermarkets, where they've got low prices, low profit margins, they do lots and lots of marketing, and they have price wars. So that's, that's a typical domination. The consumer tends to win out there. They do really well. However, you tend to find that within that, you get the danger that some will start doing price taking, where they look at each other's prices, and the customer can start to lose out. You can have a market where you've got many small businesses, so a really good market in theory. You've got lot, a bit of differentiation taking place. They're all specialised in finding a unique selling point. They've got price taking maybe happening where they look at each other's prices to try and compete in the same area and try and compete on that unique selling point they've got. But it tends to be smaller in a local area. So you tend to have quite a competitive local environment. Or you could have a market where you've got one dominant player, like Royal Mail, for example. Typically, they can set the price they want to charge. So it could be a high price. They don't have to develop things quickly, so they can develop their product slowly. Of course, it's a bad example to use of the Royal Mail because, of course, they're now going to deliver on a Sunday, so they start to diversify. 
But you could argue that's been brought about by some of the changes in the market and some of the competition that they've been facing from rivals. And then, of course, you've got to think about how can a business increase its competitiveness? Well, typically, conducting market research is one way of increasing your competitiveness. Developing a brand new product and coming up with a USP is a great way to make yourself more competitive. Using promotion methods, so advertising on TV, which is expensive, or the radio, for example, that can create a USP. It makes it harder for your rivals to compete if they're smaller than you and they haven't got the same marketing budgets than you. Use of pricing, so the pricing tactics and strategies that you use. That can be a great way to, again, make yourself more competitive. The place and the products where the product is actually sold from, because, of course, again, that can give you the edge. If you get the right place, if you're selling Coca-Cola in a leisure centre, for example, because you've got that exact spot you need to be in, then that can make a real difference competitively. Quality of the product. So the actual physical quality of the product makes a real difference. Some customers will make a choice of a product because of the quality it is. And, of course, actually... Reducing your costs, so you've got a competitive cost advantage. That can make all the difference as well. Okay, that actually concludes this online revision session. Sorry it couldn't go out live as I originally planned, but obviously like I said, I put a pre-record together. Hopefully you can use it over the holidays and it'll help you. Don't forget you can follow me on at BBusinessB or tweet me any questions anyway. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, click that little button underneath and give it a like as well. Resources are going to be on my website updated, so check out BBusinessB.co.uk. And hopefully, like I say, let me know any questions you've got, and I'll catch you all soon.